<laughs> okay, so hi guys. Um, I'm here with Rick. Um, I'm really excited about this. I have been wanting to get him on, um, on Zoom for a long time. Um, I've known Rick for about, oh, what's that? Six years, I think, something like that. We met yeah, actually six, at a spinning event in Belgium a long time ago. Um, and of course, he's an awesome spinning instructor too. So uh, we definitely have that in common. But the other thing that we have in common is we're both really into holistic health. And I'm going to let Rick, um, I'm going to let Rick uh, introduce himself because he's going to much accurate, much more accurately be able to describe what it is that he does. But Rick, welcome. Uh, welcome to our low carb challenge group. Um, and thank you so much for agreeing to do this. And I'm going to hand it over to you um, so that you can let people know what it is exactly that you do. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So, um, yeah, my name is Rick. Um, I'm, I live in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, I started around 12 years ago in the fitness industry. And from there, I started to work as a personal trainer and yeah, just teach all kinds of classes also and start to have an interest in nutrition and yeah, everything like, okay, what's related to health? And yeah, I have my own struggle also about my own health. So that's always good, I think, to mention, you know, when you start to coach people and also when you, um, yeah, you want to improve people's health, it's good when you was, uh, was there by your own, yeah, like you have experienced problems by yourself and yeah, that you also solve them by yourself. That's always interesting to mention. Um, yeah, so from the fitness industry, I, yeah, I coach a lot of people with uh, just the basic lifestyle factors also. And from the, yeah, the basic, um, yeah, lifestyle factors, I was more interesting and about like in the medical world, I saw a lot of people who came to me and yeah, they, we didn't come uh, really to the root cause of the problems. Like we saw a lot of, uh, yeah, we give them some more exercises. We uh, lower their calories. We did a lot of this kind of standard, um, ways of, you know, like uh, losing weight. Uh, later I learned about like, okay, we need to improve first the health and then someone lose weight by itself. So first improve health, then lose weight. It's happening, it's a process what will happen by itself if you give it the right tools to your body. So um, yeah, and from then like I start to, yeah, some years ago I started to be interested more in functional medicine. So um, I did my education also in functional medicine and ketogenic diets, low carb therapies, um, yeah, I really, uh, I'm really interested in everything what has to do with uh, insulin, with everything what has to do with metabolic disease, with uh, the microbiome. It's really an uh, interesting topic. So, yeah, and I work uh, already some years uh, for um, a functional medicine clinic in the Netherlands. I'm, uh, I helped this clinic also, yeah, from scratch in, uh, to build it up, like what, what it is now. So, um, yeah, we're the only functional medicine clinic in the Netherlands. We do a lot of uh, blood research. We do uh, nutrition therapies. We, yeah, it's really like the whole package. We do blood result uh, research, uh, stool testing, urine research. Um, and people who come to us, they have all kinds of chronic issues, problems, and then they come to us and yeah, we do the intake consultation. And then we're going to do the blood work, the, the complete testing, and we're going to search for the root cause of their problems. And then we start with some interventions and that can be like IV th therapies that can be supplements that can be uh, people have shortages in yeah maybe some vitamins minerals uh, yeah we will also um, adjust this problem but a very big um, factor in the whole treatment is always diet and lifestyle so that's where I come in so I mostly do that part I coach a lot of people in my daily life with all kinds of diets from a low carb diet ketogenic diets paleo paleo paleolithic diets um, yeah, all kinds of elimination diets, FODMAP diets. Yeah, we check all kinds of uh, markers. So, and then we adjust the nutritional treatment on the patients we have. So that's really important. And that's what I'm already doing for uh, many years. And yeah, we're always improving. And yeah, that's what I like. Learn new things and yeah, keep doing what you love. That is, that's amazing. And, you know, um, I've watched your journey during that as well. And of course, it's very much in the same vein of what I'm interested in as well. So you've always been my go-to when I've had questions about 
about health and wellness. So thank you so much for that. You're um, welcome. Yeah. And I'm really glad that I can introduce you to this wonderful group that we have um, put together um, of people that are interested in low carb living and how a low carb diet can actually give you better health in terms of metabolic health, metabolic flexibility. Um, so yeah, I mean, the thing that we've really been talking about within the group is insulin and, and, and modifying your hormones with um, diet and lifestyle. Um, of course, insulin resistance being the hot topic at the moment, I think in the medical field, um, is there a little bit more that you could elaborate on when it comes to insulin resistance and, and the diseases that it causes? Yeah, as we see um, in daily practice, it's like insulin and also low-grade inflammation are the two main uh, villains in this story. To, um, yeah, that's the two root causes what we often see with uh, metabolic dysfunction, with diabetes type 2, with uh, pre-diabetes, because mostly it first starts with insulin resistance, then someone becomes pre-diabetes, then often diabetes type 2. Um, we see all kinds of uh, diseases, also like Parkinson's diseases, um, dementia, we see cancer, we see heart, uh, heart diseases like cardiovascular disease. So there are so many, um, yeah, so many topics, so many um, diseases where it can lead to. So, but mostly the root cause of these problems is always you go really to the root cause and that sometimes it can be microbiome deficiencies, but like uh, you don't have the right uh, amount of uh, uh, the right uh, microbes in the gut. So that can also uh, play a big role, but often, also, it starts, you know, with the food you eat. So we always go back to the food. And then it's always the insulin resistance. It's mostly the root cause. You see also in Netherlands, we see um, there's a big, um, yeah, a lot of people, a uh, big community of people who unfortunately become really uh, metabolically um, not healthy. So they have problems with, um, yeah, uh, already with their uh, metabolic health and, and their um like the, the, the weight and the fat percentage way too high. But also if you check metabolic markers, like often, um, sometimes it takes even like 20 years before someone with insulin resistance uh, develops like the diabetes or other diseases. So, and that's a big problem. What we see often already with teenagers, we don't um, uh, treat people uh, below 18, so only adult, but we already see, we have a, a big group of patients, a growing group of patients, early 20s who already have really severe health issues and often it starts with not being metabolically flexible so if you mention their diet you really see a lot of yeah mistakes happening but they cannot do anything about that because they are misinformed so yeah. and if you then go back to the yeah the, the, the root cause of their problems often it starts with insulin resistance they become uh, they get all kinds of problems like they become fatigued they don't have uh, a stable blood uh, uh, glucose level. So they uh, often feel that they, in the afternoon, they, make a, they need to take a little nap or something like that. And yeah, and then other people say to them, yeah, but you're just like 20, 21. And yeah, but you know, like if you're already, if you're uh, insulin resistant, your body cannot produce the energy like it how it should be. And yeah, mitochondria, mitochondria are not um, really working very well. So that's also a big issue. And yeah, there's so many other things going on, but yeah. Yeah. So what do you think, what do you think some of the main causes are that there are so many more insulin resistant people these days than there have been in the past? Yeah, you see um, a big increase, of course, in the processed foods. So that's one uh, reason because, yeah, people, you know, they go to the supermarket and the government says, yeah, but we have a nice food pyramid. And this food pyramid tells you like, okay, you should eat some grains and you should, should eat uh, that um, something from that group and that group and that group and in fact they also take processed foods in there and often the processed foods that's these are the foods where the body is not make made to even you know to, to process this to for your gut it's really uh, disastrous we often see uh, food intolerances also so um, yeah that has yeah that can be you know, like, um, is, is it the chicken or the egg? You know, like the point is often that um, people, they come to the to us and they, um, yeah, they come with insulin resistance. And then we say, okay, on one side, they, they, yeah, their insulin receptors don't work very well. On the other side, they have signs of inflammation. And if you ask them about the diet, yeah, what's the reason of that? 
stress can be an issue. Uh, people have nowadays also chronic stress, so they don't really enjoy uh, a lot of things anymore, or even to take time, you know, even to take a walk in the forest to lower the cortisol level. So there's a big, um, there's also a big connection between the cortisol levels and your insulin, of course. Um, yeah, the processed foods, the, the omega-6 uh, rich foods is also a big factor. We see sky high levels of linoleic acids. Um, when you compare them to your uh, EPA levels, omega threes, so yeah, that's also a big issue with um, metabolic uh, dysfunction. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of things going on. Inflammation also call, can cause uh, insulin resistance. Absolutely, over overfed and overstressed, and, uh, yeah. and it's like a time bomb. And it's very sad to see that. A disease like type 2 diabetes, which used to be called adult onset diabetes, is now detected in, in kids as, as early as 10, right? Like that really is yeah. fairly shocking. And it's not just, I mean, we like to say that it's only in the States, but it's not actually like that anymore. It is really a worldwide thing. And I know, especially here in the UAE, there is a, a huge prevalence of of children that are displaying all of these uh, signs of metabolic disease. And it's a scary place to be actually. Now, of course, um, over the last two and a half weeks, we've been focusing on a low carbohydrate diet where we are really just looking at getting carbohydrates mainly from um, vegetables and, and low carb fruits. And of course, focusing on meats and dairy products and high fat uh, products as well. Now, some of us have made the transition really easily into, um, into fat burning. However, there's some of us that are perhaps struggling a little bit as well. And one of the things that I'm coming across with some people is a little bit of fat phobia. So they're afraid of... Um, fat because fat has been demonized for so long in the media, in food pyramids and, and that kind of thing that we feel bad when we, when we eat fat, we feel like we're going to give ourselves a heart attack um, when we eat fat, especially saturated fat and especially uh, some of the foods that are higher in cholesterol. I know that eggs have been called into question and coconut oil has been called into question a lot in the group. And I was wondering if you could shed a little bit more light on um, what fats are healthy and what fats we should avoid as well. Yeah, so that's really an um, interesting topic to, yeah, to dive in. Um, yeah, often uh, it happens with, especially with saturated fat, that um, unfortunately it really get a um, bad reputation. Uh, often this is also due to the um, to some uh, yeah bad research, unfortunately. Uh, so we often see that you know they uh, make a correlation with uh, people who smoke and who eat, for example, a lot of red meat. They have a lot of bad lifestyle factors, and yeah, these people also consume often, you know, red meat and saturated fat. So, and it, often this group of people, they don't, um, yeah, they don't uh, live very well. So they have a lot of other risk factors. And yeah, then in the end, they make the, the, the correlation like, okay, but these people, this group of people eat a lot of saturated fat. So this group, um, yeah, like saturated fat is bad. And there's a lot of, like, if you really go do a di deep, di deep dive in the studies, also about saturated fat, there's really not, much evidence that saturated fat is really um, yeah, giving you a heart attack or like even um, yeah, causing your uh, cholesterol to go sky high. Uh, there, of course, there are two things that we need to um, separate. Like we have cholesterol, of course, and cholesterol is necessary. Um, our body makes like uh, 1200 milligrams each day by itself. So if you, for example, eat eggs, if you eat uh, shrimps, what's also really high in cholesterol um, or other foods, then your body at that moment, like if you eat it, like your body eats, uh, makes less. So the liver makes less cholesterol. So that's a really smart mechanism. And um, in case a lot of people don't realize that cholesterol is really important for your health. It's important for your uh, hormonal health. So you, um, yeah, you you build all kinds of, um, uh, it's, it's used as a building block for all kinds of hormones like testosterone, estrogen, uh, progesterone um, yeah it's, it's really also important like if people want to absorb the amount of vitamin d and they go in the sun 
you need to have cholesterol even to absorb the vitamin D. And we know now also, um, yeah, during this uh, the time of COVID, that also vitamin D is a really important uh, factor. Also, uh, you need to have um, adequate levels of vitamin D. Uh, it's already there's so many uh, signs about that already. So, yeah, we know like, okay, your body will not absorb enough vitamin D um, if you have low cholesterol. So you want to have adequate uh, amounts of cholesterol next to it we need to don't uh, vilify one group of uh, cholesterol we need to do a deep dive into what is uh, the cholesterol uh, it's like in fact it's a total cholesterol is in fact the name of various uh, lipoproteins and these lipoproteins yes we have the hdl we have ldl and mostly ldl is the um, it's called the bad guy but in fact like your body both both needs it and in fact from your uh, when you eat fat this fat uh, is absorbed from the intestines, is transferred to the liver, and from there it sends all kinds of like buses around the body, like the, the liver is like the central station, and from there it's sending all these buses with, in fact, like fat transporters, like cholesterol uh, around, across the body, where it's where it needs to, like to be building blocks or something else. So um, the other point is like um, why it's demonized. It's because when people have um, cardiovascular disease, they discover that people have damage in the arteries and then um, like cholesterol is in fact acting as the, the protector. So the cholesterol is in fact like um, making a plaque uh, to, to solve the, the wound um, in, in the, 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 the art, art, article wall. So that's the, the, the point. And often we see like this is caused by inflammation. So we need to um, yeah, to use the right oils for that. And if we uh, we know that also for uh, healthy veins, uh, it's really important, and healthy arteries, it's really important to have uh, enough amount of omega-3. So uh, you can test this with omega-3 index test. And you always want to have the omega-3 index at least like, yeah, six. It's We almost don't see six, so we want to have that at least around eight or higher. So between eight and 12 should be perfect. And also the omega-3, omega-6 ratio is a very important marker. Nowadays, you can even do this with uh, just uh, with, a, with a finger sticking test, and you can just with two drops of blood, you can send it to a lab, and you can measure it. And that's also something to say something about your um, is your body able to lower inflammation? So when we see high cholesterol levels, we always want to see okay, omega three index. How is that? Yes, you're going to improve this with a ketogenic diet, of course. Um, the oils and the fats, what you don't want to eat, uh, are the more uh, omega six rich fats and mostly also called the plant fats or the the seed oils and it's also um, it's a, it's a really strange name to call them like um, vegetable oils because in fact it has, has, has nothing to do with vegetables so the point is it's mostly from soy it's made from uh, canola it's made from uh, like uh, peanut or like sunflower and these oils they're really bad for your health and also for your veins and there are so many studies uh, about that and then you also want uh, because a lot of people eat so many processed foods, their uh, omega-6 uh, in their cells is sky high. And then you also see if you do an omega-3, omega-6 test, that's the, um, often we see a um, ratio from like 20 to uh, one, uh, uh, like 20 omega-6 to one omega-3. So we see uh, really a sky high um, uh, yeah, amount of omega-6 in the cell and almost no omega-3. So if you're going to balance that and you do that with yeah, leaving the omega-6 oils out of your foods and you add more like natural foods like fish and meat and eggs and these are perfect uh, sources of omega-3 also. Um, yeah, and on the other side, you want to lower your omega-6. So the fats you want to use are the saturated fats also to cook in because you want to have a stable um, oil for cooking. Also, every fat has a smoking point. So if you cook, um, for example, if you use a margarine or a um, olive oil, for example, they have a generally a low sm uh, smoking point. So if you're going to uh, bake meat and that or something like that, you see that the oil really does get rancid today. It starts to smell, it starts to smoke, and, and then the oil is already burned. So you don't want to have this in your body because that's the oxidized oil is also oxidizing in your um, cells and also in your veins. And then that's also causing, of course, for example, cholesterol to oxidize. And that's what we can measure with oxidized LDL. So that's what we don't want. 
the point is then, okay, what we want to use, we want to use a stable fat in the kitchen. And this can be like a coconut oil. This can be like ghee. It can be uh, just a full fat butter, like the grand, like grandma and grandpa always used. Like, that's really important, you know, like think about your grandparents, what did they uh, eat? And, and mostly it's, you know, like these are real foods. There was no packages. There was no, uh, there was no high corn fructose syrup or, or something else. There was only um yeah like natural products and yeah saturated fats and nature always fats comes with protein and it's never like fats protein and sugar unless of course in in dairy there's um, of course in milk products there is some um uh, there are some carbs there are some um fats and also some proteins but in all other uh, foods like in, in fruits vegetables there are like mostly carbohydrate carbohydrates and fiber and in the um, uh, animal products is mostly a mix between proteins and fats and you know like nature uh, created that for a purpose so i think like okay just eat the foods how they should be eaten absolutely and that keeps it really nice and simple as well right it's just a yeah. no-brainer if it didn't come off the land like that then it's probably something that you should be limiting in terms of uh of intake as well and I've been talking a lot to the group about that, about some of the low carb products that are also still processed um, products, yeah, which, you know, is probably absolutely fine as a treat, but it's so easy for these things to become an everyday thing. And yeah. it's, it's so important to just keep on checking in with yourself. Is this becoming a problem for me? Am I starting to depend on it? Because, yeah. yeah, I mean, food is not just nutrition for us, right? There's a lot of um, there's a lot of emotional attachment to food and a lot of stress relief that we get from food as well. So we have to pay attention to that and constantly be asking ourselves: Is this becoming a problem? So, um, so yeah. So what I understand from you is that in terms of cholesterol. If you have um, high cholesterol levels and you are um, in trouble metabolically, if you are metabolically inflexible, if you have metabolic syndrome, that is when high cholesterol could become a problem. Whereas if you have high cholesterol, however, your body is very metabolically flexible, then it could just be another reason for that and not necessarily meaning that you will um, get ill and have uh, cardiovascular disease from that. Is that correct? Yes. And if you really want to test this, like, um, yeah, you can do also a, a particle size test. So that's also, you can, you know, like you can really deep dive into cholesterol. But often you see, especially when you're already longer in a ketogenic diet or a low carb diet, often we see like also LDL levels of um, sometimes 300, 400 or something like that. Depends, of course, um, like a lot of countries in the world, uh, they use different um, metrics for, uh, you know, like for, for the blood uh, results. So that's also what we need to, yeah, to, to see and to different sides. Of course, sometimes you need to recalculate it. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, we work with uh, German laboratories, so they have more the international, um, like what they also use in the United States, the metrics mostly. Um, and the point is when, when often we also see people, it's, uh, yeah, high LDLs from 300 or higher. But if you... Are metabolically flexible and you don't have any oxidized ldl in, in your blood and you you could always you know to be sure go to the hospital do a coordinary calcium scan to see if there's really no plaque building up that's one thing uh, on the other side if you if your omega-3 index is high enough and you take enough vitamin k2 then there was also um, a study done in Maastricht, and it's called the rotterdam study it's a dutch study and they made it uh, a study with vitamin k2 and a lot of people in Netherlands and, and worldwide are already deficient in vitamin K2. And the point is that, um, yeah, often people say like, yeah, there's really almost no vitamin K2 in, for example, animal products. But in animal products, there is the right form of vitamin K2. What we need and in plant products is vitamin K1. And often people only think that they can get enough vitamin K1 with only, for example, in NATO, in the Japanese traditional uh, dish for example but this is also it's not really in there it's fermented by the gut and then you get vitamin k2 
Um, but the point is that in uh, animal products, there's enough vitamin K2. And if yeah, you don't have uh, enough of that, you can always test it or you can add some in the form of a supplement. And there and all the MK um, from four till seven, uh, like all the K2 um, vitamins, like all the forms, they are normally also in, you know, when you eat meat and organs, it's all fine found in there. So that's uh, one point. Uh, but yeah, if you really want to be sure about, yeah, if uh, cholesterol is a problem, especially if you're, you know, when you do a long-term ketogenic diet, often it's also, it's still, um, yeah, like debatable, but often we see that when you're uh, using fat for fuel, often your, uh, your cholesterol is higher. But then you see that your HDL cholesterol is in a perfect range and also your triglyceride rate, uh, ratio to HDL. That's uh, then a more important marker. So then you're going to check much more into, okay, what says my HDL, my triglyceride, what says my fasting insulin levels? And if you compare this and if they're completely uh, within the norm and they're good, then there's no, 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 even there's no problem. So there's also no, um, yeah, you don't need to be worried about that. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what's happened is just the whole cholesterol thing has been oversimplified and they're really not looking at the whole picture. And if you really want to know for sure, if you have um, an issue, then a heart scan is going to tell you straight away whether you have any plaque formation and whether you're in any danger of having um, heart disease. But for a lot of people, just looking at one value, which is cholesterol, is not going to tell you anything. You have to dive a little deeper and, and look into that. So thank you so much for explaining that because, um, you know, I know it's a big worry because for years and years we've been fed this high cholesterol is going to kill you. High cholesterol is going to, uh, is going to cause you problems. And it's been oversimplified so much probably in terms of um, making it uh, easier for doctors to just look at one value and then prescribe or not prescribe it also because um, the industry, uh, of, of, of prescribing statins is uh, is a very good business to be in as well. <laughs> so, so, yeah, um, thank you so much for, for clarifying that. And then I was wondering, just, just to finish off with, um, do you uh, have any interesting case studies that you might want to share with us in terms of people that you've treated um, with, uh, with a low-carb diet that we can draw some inspiration from? Yeah, there's always a lot of case studies, of course, but yeah, like, um, yeah, there's, for example, some case studies, but I now can just also mention this, uh, for example, uh, like one year ago, there came also a person to me, uh, like it was last summer, and yeah, she tried a lot of diets, and she really had like chronic fatigue problems, so already some years, it became more worse after the pregnancy, but we also often see um you know, when women go into a pregnancy and they already have a lot of deficiency, it's really not a good idea. So, um, yeah. So another reason to first optimize your health and then, you know, become pregnant. Uh, so, but yeah, she really was tired, had a lot of fatigue problems, deficiencies, um, yeah, gained a lot of weight, uh, was really not metabolically flexible. Um, and from that time, uh, like within three months, like, but she tried all kinds of diets before that. So she did a standard Western diet, um, Counting calories, uh, went to the gym, do yeah, train a lot. Um, yeah, was in a very uh, big uh, deficient in, in calories. Like to try, like crash diets, a lot of things like Herbalife. Uh, yeah, a lot of things. Um, also a vegan plant based diet. Uh, she felt terrible on that. Also with her, yeah. We also after that measured all her nutrients and we saw a big deficiency in carnitine, taurine, carnosine, yeah, all this kind of, you know, how it works. Um, yeah, and then I put her on a low carb diet, but with intermittent fasting, because that was for her the best strategy. She, uh, like I put her on a two, two meals a day, um, first transitions, first from six meals a day, little meals to three meals a day, and from three meals a day to two meals a day. And she combined this when she, reach three meals a day because that's also something you mentioned like don't go cold turkey from six meals a day like eating all the time like to do intermittent fasting because that can be really uh, yeah not so nice and and yeah people can call you and say like oh that's not going well or i feel depressed or it can have a lot of reasons so 
um, yeah, but this person went on intermittent fasting, uh, a low carb diet. Um, he ate at uh, maximum like 20 grams of carbs, mostly in the forms of uh, vegetables and in the forms of salad. Um, and next to it, like, um, yeah, meat, fish, um, some organs, some um, eggs, this kind of stuff. And yeah, she lost in, in like three months, uh, 11 kilos. So um, I, I, I think you need to know this in pounds, right? Uh, no, 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 we have no? kilos, we have kilos, we're okay, we okay. kilos. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, so. I think you pretty yeah, much four. double it in pounds, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's like around 24 pounds or something like that. Yeah. Um, but like she had in two or three months, she lost finally 11 kilos and she was around 32 at that age. And yeah, the last, since her age of 16, she already was struggling, you know, with uh, with a broken metabolism, like tried so many diets, crash diets, all kinds of things. And yeah, like in three months, of course, we also did some um, blood research. We checked a lot of markers. We lowered her inflammation. Um, yeah, it's the be most beautiful things where you can see all the measurements and then you can see like, okay, inflammation goes down, cholesterol becomes better. Um, also in her case, it was interesting, her um, cholesterol was high, but her um, HDL was low and their tri triglycerides were high. So when I put her on a um, ketogenic diet, like the total cholesterol was still high, but the triglyceride levels completely normalized. Uh, below 100 what we want to see so and also the hdl stayed quite uh, stable so that's uh, another point what we yeah what we really like to see next to it we want to see that inflammation drops also her leptin levels were also uh, increased so her, um, yeah she didn't really made uh, enough leptin or the the yeah she um the problem was that she could often eat 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 without being satisfied so um yeah that's that's also a problem uh, so that's also um yeah increased uh, so yeah she, totally she lost a lot of pounds um felt great and yeah within a half year she gets her life back so yeah she's now still thriving and yeah do keep stuck keep doing also a longer term like a ketogenic diet but i advised her also you know like she did this for a half year then we did some carb cycling so then she did like five days ketogenic diet two days uh, some carb cycling um but she felt feels best when she's on a low carb diet. I also have people who, for example, already follow a low carb diet for years. But sometimes it works to yeah to have a little break sometimes, but only when you're metabolic flexible. So first reach that point. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I know um, I know myself from experience with uh, guiding people on low carb diets that. Yeah, they might come off a low carb diet for a while because they want to have a break. But yeah, they yeah. will say as soon as they get back on that they feel much more energetic. Um, that uh, yeah, that, they, that there is just more energy there to be able to be used. So yeah, I mean, can you um, can you share with us approximately how long it would take for somebody to become metabolically flexible? Yeah, it depends, of course, about uh, where they need to come from. Like in in our clinic we treat a lot of people with serious uh, issues really serious chronic health issues for example another uh, case study was um, a 70 year old man who was um, also coming to my cycling class spinning classes but he uh, tried a lot of uh, things i put him also on a low carb ketogenic diet and for the first time since he was like 40 he, he finally lost weight so he lost around also 20 he lost 20 kilos so um yeah that's also around 40 45 pounds so um yeah you know like this really nice when you see this this that people even from 70s that they go to uh, the the trainer in the gym and they say yeah but you're 70 so it's not easy anymore you know to lose weight and it's not really possible and then i think uh, yeah that's always possible but you need to you know to really find the the, the right the first is the motivation of course uh, also from the person uh, but on the other side also yeah you need to just adjust the right uh, yeah, nutrition lifestyle factors and yeah it can work really well and um yeah but this man also your 70 did a lot tried a lot and yeah he did it was uh, after three months he was in the best shape of his life but this was um yeah, this was also a combination of some sports building muscle because that's also really important thing what i even maybe didn't mention but but insulin resistance uh what i often see is like people can do a lot of cardio but i really prefer them to do strength training to build more muscles because then your um also your muscles become more insulin sensitive and also more glucose sensitive so when you build more muscle 
um, yeah, that's that's really for your total metabolism really much more effectively. So don't waste time on on do standing like an hour on a cross trainer and only counting your calories, but really do the combination. Like if someone likes a spinning class, go to, to a spinning class, but next we do some body pump or do some strength training. Like that combination is really important. Um, yeah, so, and then it also uh, takes time. Like you can do uh, some hacks also, you know, for example, when uh, people are still not uh, metabolically flexible or able to burn fat, you can try it if you're not, uh, you need to try that, but also always take some food with you. For example, if you go to the gym, and you can train in a fasted state. It can also improve your, um, yeah, your way to become more fast and, and metabolically flexible. Of course, when you do a spinning class, then you can better do, for example, from start an endurance class or so you know, like to start your base and not directly do a race day or a high intensity class because that can be quite hard uh, if you cannot tap into your your reserves. Um, yeah, so movement is a perfect tool. Um, sometimes also. Uh, yeah, people can um, add fasting. For me, I really see with a lot of patients, like when they add intermittent fasting or do something with eating windows, it also works very well. Um, sometimes when people are really, their metabolism is really broken, you can even uh, um, go on an even more strict ketogenic diet and try even, you know, for a week or something like to do zero carb, like only eat meat and some, um, yes, some eggs and some fish and some milk products. That's also a way, but like often it takes time. And when someone, of course, uh, didn't, a lot of people don't realize that uh, from childhood, uh, since they was breastfeeding, like often people never was uh, from like constantly eating. So if your your body's never used, uh, like since uh, ch childhood, like really when you're a baby to even be in ketosis. So you're, if you didn't do that for 20 years, 30 years, yeah, then you need to train that. It's, and it's exactly yeah. the same as our as our physical well being as well, right? Like if you want to if you want to run a marathon, you can't run it the first day. You have to uh, you have to start with one kilometer, and then you have to build it Absolutely. up. Absolutely, right? it's the same yeah. way with uh, with teaching your body to burn fat for fuel. It needs yeah. to be trained to do it. So yeah, and there can be so many factors because I see often that. For example, some people, they go really fast because then, you know, when you have a lot of information about somebody, you can touch the right, um, yeah, you can touch the right um, things and then, then everything falls into place and, and, and it happens very fast. But sometimes also, like I said, like you can also uh, try a CGM or like a continuous glucose monitor or something like that to also measure when you're uh, like even the foods where you eat, even if it's some some um yeah some berries or some vegetables they can even uh, put you out of ketosis or like if you react on them like from a food sensitivity standpoint it can also um yeah prevent that you can go into ketosis so there are so many things that can go on so you can if if nothing works then often i use a cgm to see okay how is your glucose response reacting before the meal during the meal when you eat something uh, that can make sense uh, sometimes uh, adding some extra electrolytes like magnesium, potassium can work. Uh, salt, of course, really important. A yeah. lot of people, it's, it's also like a demon uh, out of the head, like it's same, you know, like with, with, with cholesterol and also saturated fat, like salt is also dem demonized in a very bad way, but we really need it. If you eat more pure products and, and clean products, you need more salt. If you do more sports, if you sweat a lot, you need more salt. To balance all your magnesium and potassium. Absolutely. And for those people that are here in the UAE as well, because our climate is so hot and we're constantly sweating or we're constantly in air conditioning, yeah. it is even more important to get enough salt. And, you know, we've been made so scared of, mm -hmm. of salt that we're always like, oh, okay, we can't salt our food or anything like that. But you can, you can literally, if you're on a ketogenic diet, if you're on a low carb diet, then you can go ahead. Um, and so yeah, you need even more salt, good, right? Don't don't hold back from having your food actually taste good because salt is such a great way of actually being able to do that. And you know, we see a lot of people that have a, a palate that is formed to processed foods because they also have a lot of salt in them. So you can make so, natural foods taste really nice by just adding salt because it's such a flavor enhancer as well, right? I mean- uh, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Salt and then some pepper maybe, or it depends, some people are sensitive for that, but like often, you know, when you 
choose the right salt, like a Redmond Real salt or a Himalayan salt or like sea salt, like what also gives more minerals back. That's always a good idea. Um, yeah, next to drink a lot of water and don't drink too much water because that can also be uh, a, a trap because like if you um, transitioning from uh, like, uh, like a glucose uh, metabolism and you go more into a ketogenic um, metabolism, then also you often spill in the first time more uh, electrolytes. So you also need then absolutely more salt. Sometimes it can help to add extra magnesium. Also, when you're insulin resistant, a lot of people don't know that. It's that you don't absorb your magnesium very well. So uh, that's also, you know, priority, of course, the root cause solve your insulin resistance. The other point is like, of course, you can supplement some magnesium uh, for the first time to, it can help, uh, but don't do uh, magnesium citrate, citrate too much because that can also give you other problems. But like, uh, the, 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 yeah, take some extra magnesium, can work, uh, potassium. But I would always start with more salt. That's mostly the, the way to go, uh, especially with the potato flu or when people have really, you know, like uh, when, they, when the symptoms uh, are more worse in the beginning, like, yeah, it can have a lot of uh, things, uh, root causes, but I should start with salt. That's yeah. cool. Okay, well, that's amazing. So, um, guys, what I'm going to do is I am going to put uh, Rick's social media handles in the post here so that if you do feel like you want to have um, a consultation with Rick, he can organize that with you. If you do want to go more in depth, if you do want him to have a look at um, perhaps some of the medical tests that you've had done. Um, you can totally do that and contact him via his social media and I'll put his email address up there as well. Um, Rick, thank you so much. Um, this has been amazing. I've really wanted for a long time to get you on here and I finally did. So thanks so much for taking the time here with the group. And, uh, and yeah, um, hopefully we'll be hearing more of you uh, very, very soon. <laughs> yes, my pleasure. It's always nice to uh, yeah to speak with you and also with yeah for with all the people. So yeah, uh, they can just send me an email. That's also uh, correct. I will send you the email address where they can uh, contact me and yeah from there if they have questions, if they want to send some blood work, they can send me and I can look also at that. Um, yeah, and for the rest, like um, yeah, you you know where to find me. So yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's always thank nice. <laughs> all right.